I hope you've all had a great week. And if you've had a bad week, this is the place to be. So we will try and encourage and cheer up one another in the next hour as we worship the Lord. And I'm filling in for Pastor Chris as he's on vacation. So uh, we're going to uh, right away get rid of the announcements as uh, they have nothing really to do with worship. So let's just uh, zip through them quickly. We have a church bonfire here, August 16th. Uh, that's uh, Wednesday, 7 o'clock at the church. Uh, bring a snack to share and a chair to sit on. We have the SCC uh, dinner coming up on uh, August 21st. That's a Monday. And uh, so if you like to volunteer and help out, you're welcome. Or if you just want to come and enjoy the meal, the door is open at 5.30 and we eat at 6 o'clock. And uh, as I mentioned already, the pastor's away on uh, vacation. He'll be back the day after the civic holiday on Tuesday the 8th. That means the church office will be closed during that time. He also, <clears throat> just remind us, being on vacation, no communication with him unless it's a true emergency. So don't email him. Or He broke the rule himself. He sent me an email this morning. <clears throat> saying he would pray for us. I was going to scold him, but then I said, no, I'll just forget it. Uh, we are glad that he's praying for us, and we want to pray for his holiday, that he will <clears throat> be blessed and refreshed on the time that he's away. <clears throat> and then a further uh, announcement. This will go on the bulletin board. It says Community Choir, August the 1st. This is for the community service it will be happening this fall and for anybody that likes to sing or think you might be able to learn how uh, go to the practice it's at seven o'clock on august the first at the united church but it's inter-church it has nothing to do with the united church it's everybody from the area uh putting together a choir for the, the worship service okay so that'll go on the bulletin board <coughs> And then the next Sunday, Pastor Don Hume will be leading the service and speaking. So, did I miss anything? All right. So let's move into our time of worship. And I'll open with uh, prayer, and then we'll be in our first song. Father God, Holy Spirit, Jesus our Savior, we bow before you today, thankful that you are here in our midst, for two or three you're gathered in your uh, presence, you are there. And so we gather in Jesus' name to give you recognition and some quality time from our busy, distracted week. Help us, Lord, that we'd focus in the next few minutes to hear from you and perhaps to uh, receive and give encouragement to one another in the after service. We do pray, Lord, for your covering over your congregation here in Dundalk, those present, those online, and those who are away on holidays, for protection, for blessing, for wisdom, for health, for usefulness in your kingdom. We pray that you would use us to your glory. And we pray for your church around the world, places where the church is underground and persecuted, places where there's war and famine and great need. We pray, Lord, for healing, for relief, for provision, and for your kingdom to come, that there might be peace, harmony, and goodwill in our time. And Lord, uh, today we commit ourselves anew to you to serve and follow and love you. And for whatever baggage or handicaps or outright sin that we bring with us today, please forgive us as we leave the burdens here, we go forth clean in your eyes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first uh, song is uh, Hope of the Nations, and you can stand to sing that together.
we will worship the Lord in the giving of our morning tithes and offering. And uh, most of you, I think, give online. But uh, if uh, you would like to participate uh, this morning, uh, you're welcome. Uh, if you're a visitor, feel no obligation. Uh, we need some ushers to do that. So uh, great. We have volunteers. Thank you, guys. You know what to do with these? Yep. Good. We have confident ushers. Okay. Do your job. Thank you. And as we uh, give our offerings, it's not just to pay the bills here, although that is true. It goes for the operation of the local church. The funds also go around the world to uh, missions and various needs in our community from time to time. And so we thank you for your faithfulness in giving. And the Lord will bless you as you are generous to him. And some of you know that. The more you give, God seems to pour it on, and you can't really get ahead. He is a generous God. So we thank you for that, and uh, thank you guys for doing such a good job. Just finishing up there. You're hired for the next uh, time. Good job. <clears throat> and we'll just bow and say thanks to the Lord. Lord, we do thank you for giving us what we have materially. We live in a land of plenty. We are blessed with not just what we need, but even things that we want. We're spoiled because of your generosity. Help us, Lord, that we would pass it on and bless this offering and all the offerings we raise in your name. Further your kingdom work here and around the world. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And the next three uh, songs uh, will be on the screen up uh, front, and you sing best standing. So join me as we do these three together. <clears throat> Yeah. 
My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Free 
his only son to make a wretch his treasure. At this time, uh, we're going to have the uh, children's uh, corner, kids' corner. If kids want to come on up here and let's sit over in this row over here. Is that agreeable? We got room for everyone. And uh, Anna is going to give you a little story or an object lesson. Come and sit. <laughs> That's a Pretty good lineup. All right, great to have almost a full row across the front. My name's Anna, if anybody doesn't know. Can you hear me okay? Do any, can any of the kids tell me why we come to church? Hmm? Yeah, do you know what praising means? Praising, I think, means kind of saying, I love you, Lord. I love you. You're my, you're my Jesus. You're my God. And we say thank you as well for his love for us. Don't we? Sometimes when we're singing these songs, we're, we're thanking God for all his love for us. Yeah. Any other ideas? Throw out any other ideas? Yeah? Good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. What's your name? I don't know your name. Gabriel. I did learn that last week. So Gabriel's saying we learn things at church. That's cool. And you know what? It's really neat. We can tell God we love him. We praise him. We thank him for his love. And we like to do it together, right? 
And another name for praising is worship. And you know what? We worship a really big God, a big God that's bigger than the whole world, bigger than our church, bigger than Dundalk, bigger than Canada, bigger than the world, bigger than the universe. And we're going to sing a song that I'm hoping some of the bigger people know called My God is So Big. Hands up anybody who knows it. Yes. Great. So you guys are going to help these because it's kind of an old song, I know, but I still love it. I still sing it on my own sometimes. <laughs> Can you stand up, everybody? That's great. And do you, all your arms work? They work? Okay. Hey, some of the big people's arms work too. This is awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the words go like this. I'll say it first and then we'll sing it. My God is so big, we'll practice the actions, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, and the valleys, which happen at the bottom of the mountains, the valleys are his. The stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Okay, now we're going to sing it. My God is so, so big, big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for me and you and you and you and you and you and you. Great. Good job, kids. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, kids, for singing so well. That is a very old song from when I was a kid. <clears throat> well, this morning, in the pastor's absence, I'm not going to be preaching a traditional three-point sermon, but rather a five-point teaching session. So I prayed about a relevant topic uh, this morning, for the message, I asked myself, what might be a current issue in our church family that uh, needs addressing? And of course, in a church of our size, there's a variety of burning issues at any given time. But I believe that many of us here this morning are, are or have recently struggled with loss and grief. Now, some of us may not even be aware that we're grieving a loss because we tend to limit our understanding of grief to funerals and uh, losing someone special in death. But there are a whole host of other painful losses in life that really rock your world and uh, leave you struggling to reclaim joy, hope, peace, and security. Now, besides the loss of a spouse through divorce, an accident, or terminal illness, can you think of some less obvious losses that Christians experience? I'm going to open it up for a response uh, a loss that we may have encountered, or someone else you know may have encountered. Can you think of any other losses that we grieve? A relationship? A child? Oh, okay. An adult child that stops talking to you. Yes. I got that one on my list. <laughs> loss of a pet. Loss of a job. Anyone else? Yes. Loss of a friend. Yes, a broken friendship. Right. Sickness. My hearing's not too good. There's another loss. Yeah? 
Anything else? Yes, Tony. Hopes and dreams. I'll see you're doing my sermon for me. I, I made the list here, and you've got about half of them already. So I'm going to just go through them quickly, but if this is something that's happened to you, only if you feel comfortable, you can raise your hand, but you don't have to. So losing someone you love slowly to dementia to be replaced by someone you don't know or even like. I raised my hand for that one. Pastoral changes when a beloved pastor retires or is called to a new area of ministry. Okay? A long-term rejection by your adult children or grandchildren. Uh, a loss of relationship and communication with your adult kids. Yep. A uh, loss of Christian faith in an adult child who at one time followed Jesus. I'm putting my hand up for all these. Loss of a family pet, made even harder when you're the one who has to put them down. Yes, two hands waving there. Yeah, and a loss of your possessions in a house fire. Bankruptcy. Loss of a job or career that you enjoyed due, due to layoff, downsizing, or forced retirement. Yeah, loss of midlife dream. When you reach that critical stage in life and you realize your aspirations will never happen. Halfway on that one. I thought I would move to California and write a book and be famous. Didn't happen. Uh, loss of dreams to be married or have a family due to factors beyond your control. Yeah. Loss of your once healthy body which now permanently impairs and limits you from doing the things you used to. Well, you're not old enough. If your hand's not going up, someday it will. <clears throat> so here's my first point in the sermon. Loss and grief are universal experiences for everyone. Based on the, your show of hands, there isn't anyone present here today who hasn't encountered loss and grief. And that was true even for Jesus, who knows exactly how you feel when you lose something or someone special. And so um, it proves that Jesus' words are so true when he said to his disciples, in this world, you will, not maybe, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. As a springboard into the topic of grief, what would make a better case study that we can find in the Bible than the familiar story of Lazarus' death and his subsequent resurrection? So at this point, I'm going to read the scripture. I'm reading from the NLT, so if you don't have that version, you might just want to listen. It's a long passage, but I'd like you to listen carefully because I'm not going to reference it too much. But um, I'm looking at this passage as a counselor, which I used to be, reflecting on loss and grief. And it's from John chapter 11, first 45 verses. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the same Mary who poured the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, the one you love is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory of God. I, the Son of God, will receive glory for this. And although Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days, and he did not go to them. Finally, after two days, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. But his disciples objected. Teacher, they said, only a few days ago, the Jewish leaders in Judea were trying to kill you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. As long as there's light, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. Only at night is there danger of stumbling because there's no light. 
so they're not making the trek at night. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, that means he's getting better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was having a good night's rest, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. Then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, because this will give you another opportunity to believe in me. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and, and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to pay their respects and to console Mar Mary and Martha on their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you anything you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Mary said. Uh, I know when everyone else rises on resurrection day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die like everyone else, will live. Will live again. They are given eternal life for believing in me and will never perish. Do you believe this, Mar Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I've always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who's come into the world from God. Then she left him and returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here, and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Now Jesus had stayed outside the village at a place where Martha met him. And the people who were at the house trying to console Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she's going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell down at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She was probably yelling a little bit, maybe. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, he was moved with indignation, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But someone said, this man healed a blind man. Why couldn't he keep Lazarus from dying? And again, Jesus was deeply troubled. And he came to the, dra the grave. It was a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll that stone aside, Jesus told them. But Mar Martha, the dead man's sister, said, Lord, by now the smell will be terrible because he's been dead for four days. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you you will see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. And then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of all the people standing here, so they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out, bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told him, Unwrap him and let him go. Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. Wouldn't we all? At least at that moment, that would be a powerful testimony to the power of Jesus as the life and resurrection. Well, let's uh, pause for prayer for a moment. Dear Lord, we've just read your word. And we now ask that you'll help us to comprehend it, apply it, and use it, Lord, that we would have more abundant lives, productive lives, that we would deal with grief more skillfully, love you more dearly, and serve you heartily. The rest of our lives, we pray. Amen. So the first point is everyone experiences grief and loss. And the second point is 
some narrative background on the passage I just read. i just fill in the cracks a little bit. The story that we just read deals with one of the most challenging issues that we'll ever face in life, which is the loss of an intimate relationship like a close family member, especially painful when that loss is untimely and premature. So when news arrived that Lazarus was palliative, Jesus and his disciples were at a location uh, beyond the Jordan River called Perea. Uh, and that's where John the Baptist first started his ministry of baptizing and where he baptized Jesus. So I looked on the map to see where that is. Lazarus and his sisters lived at a bedroom community called Bethany, about 2.8 miles outside of Jerusalem. So the distance from Perea to Bethany would be around 40 miles. Okay, so 68 clicks or whatever. How long does it take to uh, walk 40 miles? Well, maybe if you're really young and fit, maybe you can do it in a day, but that's going to be a two-day walk, right, roughly. 20 miles is plenty in one day. And so I'm just doing some calculating. Scripture says that Jesus purposely delayed his departure by two days. So by the time that he arrived at Bethany, Lazarus was already dead and buried for going on four days. That's what the scripture says. Uh, was Jesus a procrastinator that he dilly-dallied for two days before he went? No, he was a compassionate healer who was determined to instill faith in his disciples and other witnesses that were standing around. You see, if he'd rushed off immediately upon hearing the bad news, and even if they walked a 24-hour nonstop trip, trip uh, through the night, they might have arrived just in time to resuscitate Lazarus, which would have diminished the impact of the miracle. So as it turned out, even the greatest skeptic could not explain away this amazing feat. And for those two sisters, this was a double whammy loss. Not only were the three siblings very close to each other, but the death of brother Lazarus also constituted the loss of their primary family breadwinner. Their parents are already gone, apparently. And so in Jewish culture, the oldest male in the family was responsible to work hard and provide for his siblings and for the female members of the family who remained. So these two sisters are in a crisis, the bleak future of hardship without anyone to earn money. Plus, they're losing their dear brother, their one and only. Okay, so the third point, five tips on dealing with grief. So I'm reading the story from a counselor's viewpoint. And as it goes with handling the many challenges in life, we can learn from the good examples of others, and we can also learn from their mistakes. Aside from Jesus, the people in this story are all flawed human beings, just like you and me. At the very outset, we notice that the disciples reacted predictably, the same way that we do to bad news. Counselors call it denial. At this grief stage, which is usually where we start off, we try to avoid seeing or admitting a painful reality as something that's unwelcome. We minimize it, play it down, and uh, we pretend that it's not that bad and make it smaller and less serious than it really is. That way we can hang on to our wishful thinking and false hopes and delay dealing with pain. Notice that Jesus softened the bad news of Lazarus' death by substituting a common euphemism. We do the same thing today, don't we? Instead of saying somebody died or is dead, that just sounds so blunt and cold. We say, oh, they passed away. They passed on. They departed. They're gone to heaven or promoted to glory. It just softens it a little. Somehow it softens reality and makes the loss more palatable. But not wanting to accept bad news, Jesus' disciples played dumb. They're not dumb guys. Stop and think about it if you're in their shoes. Why would you have to take a two-day trip in the heat to wake some guy up if he's just sleeping. 
that's stupid, a waste of time. But they didn't, they didn't want to admit that the bad news, Lazarus is dead. So they said, oh, yeah, he's just sleeping. Okay, good. He'll get, be he'll get better. But their head in the sand reaction merely forced Jesus to be more forthright and direct. And he said, Lazarus is dead. You see, the disciples were well aware that there's a high risk generated in taking this trip back to the area of Judea. Common sense would tell them there's no need to take a risky two-day trip just to awaken a man from sleep. Anybody in Bethany could do that in a minute or two without bothering Jesus. So was it abnormal or wrong that the disciples tried to keep their head in the sands, sand rather than face the music? No. Initially, it's very normal human coping strategy to pretend things aren't that bad, but then we need to move on and call a spade a spade. It's in accepting the truth, the even painful truth, that we are set free to, move, to be healed, not by staying in denial and pretending. The second point or tip is to be honest with God. Let him know how you truly feel and think. That's what both Mary and Martha did in verses 21 and 32. Independently, separately, they both said, Master, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. In the face of loss, isn't it our human default and defect to look around for someone to blame, to vent our anger and frustration on? And in the absence of finding a suitable scapegoat, uh, God is the one who gets dumped on. And when we unleash our anger to those uh, around us, it only creates more pain and heartache. So that's not a good option. We can relate to these two sisters sympathetically when they separately blame Jesus for their brother's death. And yes, we know that what they said was illogical and theologically incorrect. You would expect Jesus to scold them for being so unkind and unfair and to rebut their accusation with a verse of scripture. But no, he doesn't correct them for speaking from their emotions in the heat of the moment. God has big shoulders. As ridiculous as it seems, you can picture it, one of his kids shaking their puny fist and yelling at their creator. It doesn't threaten God for a second. He's just glad to know that we are communicating with him in the moment and being authentic even if we were irrational. At least we know he's there and he's safe to vent to and at. Now that's called negative intimacy, a very passionate, genuine intimacy nevertheless. In the Old Testament <clears throat> prophets, in the book of Job, in the writings of David, they all did a lot of yelling at God before they reached that peaceful place of resolution and rebuilding. One time I took a seminar from Dan Allender, Christian counselor, and he said, one criticism I have of the Christian church today is, unlike the church in David's day where you read in the Psalms, those are songs, some of the songs go on, the Psalms go on, where are you, God, when I need you, and why are the wicked being uh, prospering and uh, righteous are being slain, and you're not being fair, God, and you know, I really hate it. What are you doing? You know, even Jesus on the cross. My God, why have you forsaken me? He said, you never hear that in an evangelical church. We don't sing songs like that. Where are you when we need you? And how come you're not doing more and complaining and venting? He said, all we do is sing happy, happy songs and praise God. And we're thankful. And we only do the one side of the coin. But in life, we also have those horrible times where we cry out to God and we yell at him in pain. And he said, you know, that's missing. And he said, that's why I like to listen to Pearl Jam. I don't know anything about Pearl Jam, but I guess they must did a lot of venting. And uh, so anyway, this should be a safe place where we can talk about our pain. And the point is, we can be honest to God. We don't have to just tell him, happy, happy, happy. We can tell them the truth. The third thing in grief is courageously face your losses head on. In verse 16, the disciple we dubbed Doubting Thomas explains, exclaims, 
let's also go with Jesus to Bethany, that we may die with him. Now, some commentators speculate that uh, Thomas is being sarcastic, cynical, and pessimistic. But I'm not sure that's a fair and accurate depiction of Thomas. Perhaps, let's, let's say, okay, we'll take that route. Perhaps Thomas did think Jesus was being foolhardy. But despite that possibility, Thomas was the first to announce his commitment to accompany Jesus on the mission of mercy, even if it meant it was at high risk that he would lose his own life. We don't get the idea that Thomas relished the idea, but he was prepared to stick it out with Jesus and confront an ugly situation close up and personal. Now that kind of informed confrontation, what bothers us most, takes immense courage. Wouldn't you agree? We never get over losses by hiding in a safe place, hoping problems will go away on their own if we wait long enough. Instead, we need to walk back with Jesus to the crisis and let him help us deal with it. Courageously face your losses. The fourth thing we notice is share your losses and grief with those who truly care. Likely there are some here today who are a bit on the cautious side, which I am about sharing personal things and grief issues. And if you're a private kind of person, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's why I can relate to the cartoon depicting this sour, crotchety old man driving his car, and the caption under it says, the reason I don't signal uh, is because it's nobody's business where I'm going. <laughs> and uh, if you're like that, you might say, no, I don't really like to tell people about all the tough things that are going on in my life. It's nobody's business. However, when you keep your grief private and secretive, the load is on your own shoulders all the time. In so doing, we deprive others of the blessing of comforting, encouraging us in times of loss. The Bible commands us to comfort one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, and weep with those who weep. None of that can happen unless we say, yeah, I'm going through a tough time. Could you pray for me? Notice that weep with those who weep. That's exactly what the compassionate Jesus did in verse 35. He wept openly. He didn't hide his grief. A scripture says that the house of Mary and Martha was crowded with people who came to comfort those sisters. How did they do that? How did that happen? There's no Facebook. There's no uh, radio announcements. Somehow, Mary and Martha were able to spread the word of their plight to quite a large number of supporters. Perhaps in that gathering, there were the curious. Perhaps there were those looking for a free funeral lunch. In the gathering, there would be those who belonged to the Pharisees. They'd send a delegate or two. But presumably, there were those who truly cared, who are not paid mourners, but genuine friends to a family in their time of need. Share your grief with others. <clears throat> and the last tip is, have the last word over your losses. This is exactly what Jesus did in verse 43. He took authority over the work of Satan, who is an invisible robber, destroyer, liar, murderer, um, instigator, division, conflict, losses, and death. Jesus did not let death have the last final word. Lazarus, come forth, he commanded in a loud voice, a specific last word on a specific situation. And one commentator wrote, the reason Jesus specified Lazarus by name is that otherwise everyone who'd ever died would have been resurrected all at the same time. Well, I don't know, but that's cute. Anyway, the point of this miracle is that Jesus has the final authority over death itself. He is the source of all life and resurrection. We jump ahead to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. This truth is reiterated, reading from the message. And I quote, Regarding what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over them or grieve over them, like people who have nothing to look forward to. And listen to this quote. As if the grave were the last word. 
since Jesus died and broke loose from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who have died in Jesus. As believers, we have a, an eternal hope this world can never offer. There is no loss on earth, material or immaterial, that is permanent, but merely temporary for Christians. Everything is ultimately restorable or replaceable. Absolutely nothing, no ordeal or loss will ever separate you from the love that Christ Jesus has for you, unless you let it. Have the last word. Ten chapters before the story of Lazarus, Jesus is introduced by the writer John as the eternal first and last word. Word. Whatever grief may be lingering in your life this morning, speak the last word over your situation in Jesus' name. Now, I can't remember my own points, so I write them out here. Here's the five points. Leave room initially for denial. Sometimes you have to stick your head in the sand. It's just buy some time. Secondly, be honest, God. Courageously confront your losses. Fourthly, share your losses with others who care. And speak the last word, Jesus, over your losses. All right, I hope that will help you if you're dealing with grief now or down the road. Uh, we certainly all run into it from time to time. But Christians do grieve differently from those who do not believe because Jesus is our hope. And we're going to close by singing uh, What a Beautiful Name. If you want to stand for that, it uh, goes on the screen.
Remain standing for the benediction taken from Hebrews chapter 13. And now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, all that is pleasing to him. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep by an everlasting covenant signed with his blood. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.